Welcome to the App and Top Mobile App Marketing Podcast. For so many mobile app developers, it's an all or nothing battle out there in the App Store. This App and Top Podcast is your mobile app marketing advantage. Let's get that new app of yours moving to the top. This is the App and Top Mobile App Marketing Podcast. And now your host, Michael Bauer. Welcome, welcome. This is the App in Top Mobile App Marketing Podcast produced by AppInTop.com. You can find our daily blog, and we suggest that you do, at blog.appintop.com. Also make sure you track us down at Facebook, facebook.com slash appintop. And because we tweet and hope you do as well, follow us on Twitter at appintop underscore com. That's appintop underscore Com. Founded in Berlin in 2009, Wooga is a Facebook and mobile game developer and publisher. Every month, 50 million, let that sink in for just a second, 50 million users play Wooga games such as Monster World, Diamond Dash, Jelly Splash, and many others. So we invited head of Studio 42 at Wooga and the creator of Wooga's most popular Facebook game, Monster World, Stephanie Kaiser, to the podcast to talk about metrics-driven design and viral mechanisms in mobile games. Stephanie, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Hello, Michael. <laughs> uh, let me ask you this. You created Monster World, a farming game launched on Facebook in 2010. It has 50 million users and nearly 7 million likes on Facebook. Aside from immediately the congratulations and the bowing that you can't see that I'm doing, but that I'm doing to you, um, there was no advertising on Facebook back then. So how do you get this massive audience aside from having an amazing product? Yes, so basically I cannot really... Um take that away from the product because I think it was the product was the marketing as well. So at the time um, the, the uh, platform was Facebook and the marketing channels we could use were basically feed posts and then later on that switched to requests. And um, if you build in those um, and use them cleverly then that makes a game grow of course because um, well you would see a feedback feed post on your Facebook wall of your friends playing a certain game and if you get interested then you go into the game and also if you get a request and you're interested in a game then you go into the game and that made the game grow. Of course you need to use them cleverly and um, I think I have to mention again that once we, when we launched the game it was not really a success and we kept on working on the, and iterating on the first uh, uh, user experience and then also of course on those um, uh, retention and viral mechanics but it was this um, it was this order so we first worked on the first time user experience and then we worked on retention features because if you put in a lot of users and they are not sticking around then it doesn't really help if you put in a lot of users right so yeah. after we had fixed all of those then we worked on those viral mechanics and I think to cut it short the most important thing is really to build them into the core of the game so it really means something to the player and that is worthwhile to use. And um, only then they will, um, they will use that feature and then only then they will send it to their friends. I can give you examples later on. That'd be great. And, and with that, so it almost sounds like because of the, at that point, lack of advertising on Facebook, like it was a sort of a grassroots effort that you guys built directly into the game with hopes of these things taking off like you were talking about. That's what sort of, in addition to the quality of the game, that's what sort of moved the game forward. Absolutely, yes. So um, you were able to um, invite your friends from the game. You were able to, um, it sounds really bad when I say it, but to use your friends to help you um, to progress in the game. And I think if you really care about the game, then you do that and you want to share this experience with your friends. Stephanie, if you're like me, you have a couple, more than a couple of friends that use you anyway, so I don't mind you saying that here. I have no problem with that at all. Uh, when, when, when did the mobile game, when did the mobile version of the game came out? When did that come out? So that was in March last year. Okay. Only and, March last year. And, and what kind of changes did you have to make to the viral mechanics to make them work on mobile, if any? Yeah, so I have to say it was the same for the mobile version. Well, first off, um, the game is not the same on Facebook as it is on mobile. So we basically built it from the ground up mm -hmm. to have a real mobile experience, which basically meant that the version was not connected to the Facebook version. So um, it was really a different game. It had different plans. It had um, a different uh, balancing. So the only uh, thing that was the same was basically the core mechanic, planting and harvesting quirky stuff. Um, but aside from that, anything 
everything was different. And uh, so were the viral mechanics. Although I have to say that, again, it was the same um, order in which we look at the games. So first we look into the onboarding and of the user so the player can get really easily into the game. And then we look into the retention um, uh, mechanics. And only then we focus on virality. And since the game, I have to be honest, was not super successful, um, we stopped working at, uh, on it at a certain point in time. And we never really digged deep on virality. So with the, that was the mobile version. You also had a problem with the mobile version taking off? Yeah, exactly. And it never took off completely, right? So um, the Facebook version was way more, uh, way more successful than the mobile version. Mm. So mm -hmm. when you talk about that evolution, because obviously, as you're saying, you're going back and forth, you're, you're, you're reading the reviews, you're getting the input from, from players, you're sort of redeveloping, adding some of those things, taking away some things. What kind of an evolution does that have? How much time are you putting into that evolution before you get to the point where you say, okay, now we feel like we're, we're kind of settled in? Or is there? Is there a point where you feel like you're kind of settled in? You mean settled in with the game, or yeah, with the, with the game, or with the changes, the features mm. that you need to needed to make in order to get to that level of success, where you felt like now it's become um, something that we can start really understanding the level going forward. So there is no point of being settled in, basically. Never. Um, either you stop working on the game because it's not super successful, and um, you basically say, "Oh, we, so we keep it as it is." or you have a super successful game at hand and then you continue working at it. So that's what we call games as a service. Okay. And um, for Monster World there has been for years a, a game team working on it um, and um, uh, every week there was a new version basically. Um, but that's the Facebook version now. And, and um, Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, Stephanie, I, with that, do you find that even with the, the new games that you're developing, that that still remains the same protocol for the development of the game? It still, still remains that you, you're going to constantly alter change and listen to the feedback from the players? Yes, of course. If it's, a, if it's a successful game for us, then we do that. So, for example, Jelly Splash has a game team still on it, and they are working on it. They are, they are iterating on the game. They are not putting out a version every week because we all know that you have to submit to Apple first, and mm -hmm. you cannot really do that on a weekly right. um, uh, cycle. Yeah. Um, so that, I think, is the only difference. But um, for, uh, also for Jelly Splash, uh, there is still a team working on it. And we keep iterating, we keep adding new levels, and we keep um, looking into the features that are in the game and uh, tweaking them. Now, you, you mentioned earlier, first of all, let me just reiterate that we're talking uh, with Stephanie Kaiser, the uh, head of Studio 42 at Wooga, creator of Monster World. Um, can you plan... For virality, I mean, can you take a casual mobile game and say that if you add these features, the game will fly? I mean, obviously you're saying that there's steps and you kind of understand those success, uh, steps to success. Can you plan on that? Is that something you take into account when you're developing these games? I don't think you can really plan on it. First of all, I think there are different kinds of virality. So uh, one is that you have mechanics within the game, yes. And I think you can plan on those, but it's always an assumption, right? So mm -hmm. when you come up with a concept for a game, um, it would be really good if you think about viral, viral features from the start. Mm -hmm. Um, because, as I said, they need to be um, at the core of the game because otherwise they will not uh, mean anything to your player. Um, so you need to think about them from the very beginning and then you can build them in. But I think even if in one game a certain viral feature uh, was successful, it doesn't mean that that's automatically the case for the next game because all games are different and especially for different genres, um, the, the mechanics, the viral mechanics that you can use are very, very different. And then there is, I think, one part that you cannot plan at all, um, which is word of mouth. So yeah. Um, I think for that, not only is that unmeasurable, which <laughs> makes it really difficult yes. um, to talk about that because <laughs> I like talking about numbers. Yes. Um, but it's something that um, it's it's unplanable, really. I mean, you can you the only thing you can really do is create an amazing game experience for the player, mm -hmm. and that way um, um, they will stand in line in the coffee shop and show it to their friends because yeah. it's just the most amazing game on their iPhone at the moment. And, but, and if they find the way to to, to uh, dip into that virility that you've built into the mechanics aspect of yes. it, then of course they're going to share it. Do you find that it's predictable or unpredictable? What would you suggest in whatever you plan in mechanics-wise, what's actually used? Do you find surprises in areas where you go, well, I didn't think they were going to want to use that as sort of the viral method, but they're using that? 
Well, I mean, of course, if you build something in that that is um, connected to the core, you can plan that they will use it mm -hmm. to some extent. But of course, there are sometimes uh, surprises. I mean, how often have I been surprised about something, uh, uh, some decisions that I had taken for games? Mm -hmm. And then I, I mean, as I said, like all product decisions are based on assumptions and you take an assumption and then you look into the numbers and afterwards you're just being proved wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and that's fine. I mean, I'm happy about it to yeah. have numbers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's always a good thing if that happens along those lines, especially if you go, wow, I wasn't expecting to see those kinds of numbers in return. It's when things fall apart that uh, you're right. not necessarily thrilled. Can you give us an idea of, of what some games are that you're working on now? And then with that, more importantly, what kind of social sharing features you're testing? Yes, all right. So at the moment, um, we are working on several games, uh, of course, in different stages uh, mm -hmm. in prototyping and uh, production, and some are even in soft launch. Um, and they are across uh, the board. So they are in different genres, but, um, so, well, they are all for mobile, so that's what they share. Um, and as I said, like for the different games, it's very, very different which kind of viral features you are using. Um, so I can't really go into specifics there because it's so different for the sure. different uh, games. But, um, for example, as you see in Jelly Splash, for example, you um, are... are Oh no! In Diamond Dash, um, you are you have lives that you need, right, mm -hmm. to play around, and um, mechanics like that will always be in uh, this kind of game genre. I think they'll always be an aspect. They'll always find a home there. Mm -hmm. um, do you guys have psychologists on your team when you design viral mechanics, or are they based on common sense? Where, where, what kind of depth do you go to for those mechanics? Right. So I see the psychology um, uh, part of it as part of our job, basically. Okay. So I just recently read a book uh, about game design. Very interesting. And um, uh, there it was described that that's actually part of your work. So no, we don't have a dedicated psychologist working on it. But um, I believe that our game designers are partly psychologists. Okay. So you guys have a little bit of psych in you then. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I like and, that. <laughs> and also, I mean, I think you know that we are doing a lot of user tests. So uh, we invite people and we do that in person. So we don't have a dedicated team for that, but it's always the teams working on, this, on the game. And also, I am still uh, going to those user tests, really watching players using our games mm -hmm. and uh, playing the games. And from that, you can learn so much, really. Yeah. And um, that is like, that is practic uh, practical and not really practical knowledge and not really really theoretical and i love right, that right <laughs> now in regards to viral mechanics um can viral mechanics work just because the game has no analogs in the app store no i mean well i think i think it's both like if there of course it's good if there is no analog in the app store mm -hmm. um I think it's good because it's something new. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, that's just not enough. I mean, it, the game, like nowadays, there are so many apps and games on the App Store. I think you just have to be outstanding and you have to create a great game. Um, and that combined with something new, of course, is the best. Does it, do you find that there's any way, like if there's a certain genre, uh, is there an opportunity just based upon that genre to, to see some level of success? Or is that just nowadays just out of the question? Huh, that is a very good question. I mean, if you look at the App Store in the past and in the top grossing games in the past years, mm -hmm. uh, it's very surprising that um, it's almost always in the same genres. Um, so there is always resource management, there is always mystery, and so on. So you can you can do a study about that. Absolutely. Um, while I still think that there are other genres to be tapped in. On deck, the top five best performing mechanics in Wooga games and how Stephanie Kaiser, head of Studio 42 at Wooga, rewards users to get their friends to play without breaking any of those nasty app store rules. If, if there's a way to do that, Stephanie, when we come back here on the App and Top podcast. This podcast is produced with support from App in Top, an automated mobile app marketing platform in App Store and Google Play. This is the App in Top mobile app marketing podcast. I'm your host, Mike Bauer. Stephanie Kaiser, head of Studio 42 at Wooga, joins us to talk about metrics-driven design, viral mechanisms in mobile games. Can you name top five of the best performing viral mechanics in Wooga games, Stephanie, or at least give us a little insight as to what they are. 
Yes, so um, I think one of the best performing ones was, or I think one of uh, one that really works well was in uh, Diamond Dash, for example. You need lives to play it, right? To play mm -hmm. a round of Diamond Dash. Right. Um, and at a certain point in time, you run out of lives. And then you can either wait or you can ask your friends for lives. And um, since, I guess, since you are playing, you are engaged with the game, you really want this life and you don't want to wait sometimes. So you ask your friends and you send a request to your friends and um, once they get back to you, you get a life from your friend. Um, that is something that, as I mentioned before, if you build a viral mechanic into the core of the game and people really care about the game, then they will send this request. Um, and I think um, it doesn't get old that on uh, on the iPhone you still get a push notification if somebody in Diamond Dash uh, overtakes you. Sure. Um, like for example, um, imagine the situation where you get a where you where you get um, the uh, the push notification that your mother overtook you in Diamond Dash. <laughs> Unthinkable, right? <laughs> But it happens. It happened to me. And um, to be honest, I think this will never lose uh, its effectiveness because, I mean, you want to be better in Diamond Dash. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. When you think about getting that notification, you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. This can't happen. There's no way that this can happen. So so it, it doesn't have to be something that's simple, passive, a status update. This legitimately can be a request and then thus brings your friends into the fray. Exactly. So I think it's it's really something active. It's uh, something that is share worthy, but also um, you like you get a reward as well. And um, um, I think, as I said, like it needs to be um, in the in the core of the mechanic, mm -hmm. and um, only then because somehow you are also bothering your friends. Or I think uh, a lot of people are thinking, "Oh wow, I'm bothering other yes. people." Yes. So therefore, uh, it needs to mean something to the player. And uh, as I said, like in Diamond Dash, this life really means something to you because you need it to actually play the game. You know, uh, Stephanie, you are starting to sound a little like a psychologist now, if I ask you that. <laughs> it's, it's right there on the precipice of it. Now, now with that, do you find that that's like sharing lives? Is that something that users are sharing the most? I mean, obviously, that can change the outcome of a game possibly for you. Does that seem to be something successfully that you're seeing being shared? Um, yes, but it doesn't really change the outcome of the, the game because you just simply need it as a resource in the game, right? True. Uh, and um, also, um, there are other mechanics in, uh, in other games where, um, of course, you need to make sure that the balancing is not off all of a sudden. I mean, still, um, if you are competing on a high score list, it's still the results of uh, the players need to be comparable to each other. And um, so something that you get through a viral request shouldn't make life too easy for you. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, with that, can you, can you challenge players to, to a game? Can you, I know when I think about what it would be a distraction to your friend or you not wanting to bother your friend, as we mentioned in the psychology a second ago, uh, I would imagine that requesting somebody to a challenge would be more intrusive than perhaps, hey, I need a life over here. Yes, that's true. We don't have that yet um, um, in this specific way. Um, as I said, like the challenge at the moment is really high score and you want to be better than your mother. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, give me an example of a viral mechanic that maybe didn't work as well as you wanted to, if it worked at all. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I think, yeah, I can only come back to this point. If you do something like a feed post um, and uh, or a request um, that is not really connected to your game, like you send a gift for example, and um, you get so many gifts of so many friends that it's not really um, what you need in the game. If mm -hmm. it's just some kind of decorative item or so and you already had it or you don't want it and it's not really the core of the game. Like, for example, in Monster World, you can send around uh, decorative items. Maybe you want it because you want to decorate your garden in a beautiful way, but maybe you don't because you already have it. That's not really the stuff that you really need. In Monster World, what you need are magic ones or in the mobile version, it's called a sun potion okay. um, that um, that speeds up your plants, right? Because right. Um, plants grow for three minutes to 48 hours and um, you want to speed them up because you want to progress faster. So if a friend sends you a magic wand, that is way more important to you than a decorative item because that's decorating the game uh, or the area is not really the core of the game. Correct, yes, that's true. Um, are there... 
And can you, this is probably a bigger question, can you reward users to get their friends to play in the game without breaking App Store rules? Well, um, I think the best way um, to reward the user um, and to get them to play is really to um, build an amazing game. <laughs> okay. It all, it all literally, I mean, it makes sense that all comes back to that. At the end of the day, mm -hmm. that's what you want to have. Exactly. Did you guys experiment with offering, like you've talked about the lives and, and the wands and the, the potions. Did you ex experiment with offering more gems or perhaps coupons for third-party products or services? Did you no. test that out at all? No, we didn't. You just went with this direction. Mm -hmm. I like it. I think that's a, that's a better direction to go, at least as far as feeling like you're invested as a game player. Mm -hmm. in the end yeah, I agree. <clears throat> okay, now, from your perspective... The most important virality metric or metrics, if there's multiple ones, what would you pinpoint? What do you, what do you, when you, for instance, and this is just my belief, Stephanie, once you're done reading your psychology books and your Sigmund Freud books, when you get in in the day and you're ready to sit down and open up some email in your inbox, uh, what's the one metric you go to first to sort of determine the success level or what you want to look at first in regards to virality? Right. So I think the very obvious one is how many requests have been sent. Okay. Um, but I think that's just the total number and that doesn't really help you much. Um, the one that is most important, I think, is really like how many people have gotten a request a day and how many came through this okay. then back to the game. Like how many new users and how, how many old users, so to speak, came through requests into the game. <clears throat> And are you looking for sort of, I mean, I would imagine that you're looking for a substantial more new users than some of the ones that have been around for a while. But is there, is it more of you're looking for an even factor as if there were a scales, if you will, um, that you would have a lot on one side of the current users, the core users, and then the new users coming in? Um, to be honest, I think they are equally important. Of course, new users are important, but um, what makes our games successful is really the long, um, the long term retention. Okay. So, Monster World, for example, was as successful since players would play the game for years. And if you would ask them, like, for how long have you played the game, they would say five years, and I would always go, like, well, I only designed it four years ago, so that's not possible. Yeah. But um, players really uh, uh, play those games uh, for a long time, and if we can uh, have a mechanic that brings in also old players, that's wonderful because that's a retaining player, and they are, they are engaged, right, and engaged mm -hmm. players mm -hmm. in the end hopefully pay as well or invite new users again. Um, so I think both are equally important. Now, I, I think I'll know the answer to this question, but I, I want to get your thoughts and perspective as well. When you talk about some apps that go viral real quickly and then suffer massive churn, like the walkie-talkie apps, for example, or Flappy Bird, mm -hmm. you acquire your target users quickly. Equally, you quickly lose them before you had a chance to make any money. Uh, that type of virality, is that detrimental to games going forward as far as the future goes? And do you think enough people are sort of changing their perspective on that to say, hey, we had that massive launch, had a huge bunch of viral success, and then the game died off the face of the earth is that something that's changing in the gaming world now um i think what is maybe changing is what is the view on what makes a game successful and to be honest what makes a game successful is as i said before it's really uh, the retention mm -hmm. and if players are still there after 250 days that's wonderful because they have played every day or maybe every every two days it doesn't really matter but they are engaged with your game and they come back um, of course, it's wonderful if you get a lot of viral traffic, but um, that has always been my third priority. The biggest priority was always the game needs to be really awesome, and um, for that matter, it needs to retain, uh, or because of that, it needs to retain the uh, play as well. That uh, sounds like a psychologist and a developer to me. Um, <laughs> Stephanie Kaiser, head of Studio 42, will be joining us here uh, on the App and Top podcast. So in regards to, you, know, you mentioned earlier that in, in the cases of, of your Facebook game, and then again, when it went to the mobile game, you didn't have the greatest amount of success that you were looking for at that time. It was a little slow to start up. Is there a way to, in the cases of like the walkie-talkie apps or Flappy Bird, that you can offset the churn and still increase retention? Is there a way to, to burn up that virality at the onset and then still retain some retention? Can, can you, with those apps in particular, I don't know how you necessarily continue to hold people into them. I don't know if you can make anything better there. Is there a way to go from burn to retention? So if you already have a game that burns? Yes, yeah, correct. 
Ooh, that's a difficult question. Yeah, it sounds to me like you've already, you know, that's the, the, the barn door is closed on that one already. Well, I would say you can think of it. I can't really give you a solution, for example, for Flappy Birds. But yeah. what I do know is that um, when we start uh, working on games um, that we already think about something like an elder game or wh what we call an elder game, mm -hmm. which basically describes like why would a player come back on day 150 or 250? Mm -hmm. Like what is, the, what is the strategy behind it? And for example, for a resource management game um, like Monster World, you really need to think what is the task or the goal of a player in a session in a week something that the player can reach in a week and then mm -hmm. something that a player can reach only within months of playing the game okay and only if you have thought about such mechanics then um, of course you build them in and hopefully they work out I mean as I said it's again based on assumptions but at least you need to have a concept and we start with this when we when we work on the game it's already in the concept like this thinking of how do I retain the, the player so at the concept you're also thinking not only do you think about how you retain the player but also your viral element that all begins at the at sort of the conceptual and the beginning stages of these games. Yes, exactly. Because I think both need to be connected to the core of the game, and only if that makes sense, then um, people will really like it. And then, how do you iterate the design process to improve effectiveness in regards to the viral elements as well as the? I mean, obviously, if you're setting up something for a month and then again at four months, depending on the length of the player and retention, you're you're again you're hoping for that. But how do you you iterate the design process to improve the effectiveness of either or both of those? Right. Um, so uh, what we do is, uh, of course, we uh, a, a talented game designer comes up with a great idea or a good idea or mm -hmm. just any well, game, idea. Game designer and psychologist, if I may. Yes, yeah. exactly. So um, that's one person, but they come, they and one person come up with yes, an idea. Yes, correct. Um, and this is based on, well, looking at the market, um, also experience, basically, and, of course, new ideas. And what we then do is um, pitch it, um, or not really pitch it, I think pitching is the wrong word, but um, basically show it to other game designers across the company just to get their feedback okay. as well. And um, so iterating on the concept there is very important. And only then we build it in. Um, and if it's a live game, for example, and it's a feature for a live game, it's easier to uh, validate because then we can put it live for a subset of user in a, uh, users in an A-B test, where, for example, 50% of users see a button in red and in green. Um, this is just an, uh, a simplified example. Um, and then we can measure, basically, which version works better. And the numbers... Um, tell the truth, basically. So that's that's the easiest way of, um, of validating. Then also what we do is a lot of user testing. Um, but user testing doesn't really give you data. It just shows you whether you build a feature that people understand, which is equally important. So that's why we do both. Um, but um, I think, as I said, like it doesn't give you a validation on this feature will increase uh, this KPI that you plan to increase. Gotcha. Stephanie, when we come back... Staggering numbers. Out of 40 prototypes, only three will see the full launch. Stephanie Kaiser, head of Studio 42 at Wooga, explains the process and the criteria needed to be one of the chosen ones in seconds here at the App and Top Podcast. This podcast is produced with support from App and Top, an automated mobile app marketing platform in App Store and Google Play. <laughs> This indeed is the App and Top Mobile App Marketing Podcast. I'm Michael Bauer, your host. We would love to hear from you. So please send us your comments, thoughts, screenshots via Facebook at facebook.com slash app and top or tweet us your questions, thoughts, theories, or perhaps just psychological problems you're dealing with. We'll see if we can get them through to Stephanie. Tweet us at app and top underscore com, app and top underscore com. Stephanie Kaiser. Head of Studio 42 at Wooga joins us to talk about metrics-driven design, viral mechanisms in mobile games. So, Stephanie, uh, head of marketing at Wooga, recently talked about uh, starting marketing the game at the prototype stage and before the production even begins. Out of 40, am I correct in somewhere? Out of 40 prototypes, only three will see the full launch. Can you talk a little bit about that selection process and maybe an example if you've got one of a recent game? Yes, so it's funny that um, our CEO actually gave a talk about exactly this topic. It's called, uh, it was at GameSpeed this week. 
Um, and basically, uh, we, what, it's the approach of the HIT filter. Um, and um, that's the process. Uh, the process behind it is basically that we ask ourselves every month for every project, in, no matter in which stage it is, whether this is still what we believe in is going to be the next hit. And each project goes through different phases. Uh, the first one is all, always the concept uh, phase. Then you go into pro prototyping where you build a prototype in very dirty code um, just to um, make sure that um, a game is fun. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, you test it a lot and um, then you go into production and you deliberately um, throw away the old code because that was the dirty one and yeah. the fast one. And then you start from scratch and produce the game and then you go into soft launch look into the numbers and then only then it will launch if the numbers are are, are good um, and as i said like throughout this process we have um, a monthly meeting for every game a okay. review process and in this meeting there is always the product lead of the game that's the boss of the game if you want to call it that way mm -hmm. um, and then there is always the head of studio so I'm attending um, uh, the ones from my studio and then always the CEO and two independent consultants basically from other studios and I think um, what is important to understand about it is that this is not a committee deciding but it, this is rather an open discussion about this question is this going to be the next hit gotcha. um, and and only then, um, after that, the product lead decides, okay, we will continue with this game or we will stop it. But it's the product lead to decide um, and no one else. So not even I am deciding that. And one of the examples, uh, the recent examples is uh, Woobies, um, which was a side scroller. And basically this game made it until production. So um, we built a game in production um, up until production where we saw in the first session, everyone was amazed of the game and um, um, really like emotionally connected to it. The graphics were amazing, the look and feel, even the interaction with the phone. Um, but then um, the product lead at a certain point in time during production stopped the project. Um, and that was because, um, and that is one of the uh, main uh, metrics that I'm returning to all the time, is... Um, we couldn't imagine that this game would retain users for, for months and years. It was fun in the first week. It was really brilliant. But it would, I don't, I, we didn't see people coming back to it um, after a year still. And that's what the business model of free-to-play is based on. So okay. that's why the product lead then stopped the game and now started a new one. Uh, just for a second, I it just I wrote it down because I thought if anybody listening wanted to start a pop punk band someplace down the road, Hit Filter would be a great name for a pop punk band down the road. But um, <laughs> take me inside that meeting for just a quick second. I know you say it's it's not uh, one person's decision. There's just questions that get asked in that monthly Hit meeting. What's one question that you always ask of those leads and of the developers? Huh, that is a good question. Well, um, or maybe I mean, it's, maybe it's something you want to know at that monthly. Like, what is it uh, development wise? If there's something that's changed, what is it that you're always looking for to walk out of there before you give a thumbs up to that game? Yes. So for me, it's several things and several very important things. So I can't name one, but I can name several ones, which sure. is first, are you having fun with the game? I think that is, it's super crucial because if you're not having fun, then that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Do we believe that people will have fun with this over uh, months and years? Um, so is it long-term retaining? But then also for me as a head of studio, it's super important whether the product needs still um, of course, believes in it. But also a question that I'm always asking is, what is the team thinking? Ah. Because I truly believe that if the team doesn't believe in it, then you can stop it because, um, or you have to change the team if you believe in the idea. Sure. Um, but I think the team has to be behind the, the game, right? And um, you would, I think you always see in games if something was wrong in the teams. <laughs> now, and that's why me as a head of studio, I'm still interested in that as well. Absolutely. And I think that those are great questions to have. And you're, you're hoping for the most honest answer from those leads as well in regards to what the team is thinking about things. Um, what, what point? Is there a point? It sounds like there's not a point that things are too late to kill the game or perhaps even too early to kill a game. Uh, because it sounds like you went through all of this sort of the, the, the testing, the updates, the monthly meetings, you were about ready to go with this, and you still kill the game anyways. Is there a point where it's a right time to kill a game? Um, always. 
Always, it's, it's always, always available. the right time to okay. kill a game if you don't believe in it anymore. And I think that's something that um, in Uga we have um, not done right in the first years. So imagine this, in the first four years of Uga, we have stopped one project in production. So you can imagine right. how much of a catastrophe that was. <laughs> it was huge, super huge. Like the, I still remember the faces when we did an all hands and we uh, basically told everyone in the company that we stopped the game. And I think it was a super huge catastrophe and everyone was like, oh my God. Black, and, um, black clouds came over the studio. It was <laughs> yes, just very dark exactly. in there. <laughs> yes. And that's when we learned that um, uh, uh, it was connected to failing somehow, stopping again. Right, right, right. On the same notion of failing, which I think is completely wrong. Um, because if you stop a game that you don't believe in anymore and that you found out over time that it's not going to be successful, then you really have to stop it because it can only go down what's from there so it it only has downsides if you continue working on that game and um, that's why in the past um, year we have or even longer now um, we have tried to um, put this hit filter in in place and um, worked with it and put this into our culture as well that like this understanding of stopping a game is not a failure. And actually nowadays it happens sometimes that if somebody stops a game in the company, other people congratulate. And I think that's that's what you want to have because that's the that's the right culture in my view. <laughs> Are you sure you don't have a degree in psychology? Because that's uh, that's that's very I've actually may have heard a may have heard a therapist say something like that to me before. It's not a failure. Uh, okay now Wooga is also a third party game publisher. Is there a selection process that you can talk us through? I mean obviously we hear about these meetings and I and I get some insight from you as to what they're like when it comes to working with a third party uh, are there certain games that stand a good chance of being selected or what's the process that to the best of your understanding so it's <clears throat> it's the same process uh, actually. same exact it's, process yeah i mean um, we are a product fo focused company so um, of course we look at the games um, and um, then once we decide to um to uh, publish a game, it just runs. It just <laughs> runs through the hit filter. The basically. same filter, gotcha. Yes, okay. exactly. All right. Last question we've got here for you. Mm -hmm. Viral mechanics. How and and more importantly, give us one thing you'd like to see evolve in the future in regards to viral mechanics. Oh, that's a very good question. So, um, I th I certainly think that there will be new viral mechanics in the future, and that we will still see proven ones, and we will see, still see new ones. And um, I really think that um, playing together with others is at the heart of playing, mm -hmm. basically, because it comes from board gaming, right? Um, people are playing together, so that's why I think there will be more of the, this. Um, I don't have a specific example. I can only talk about one experience I had sure. when I was playing together, uh, but that was on the console, um, and that was um, the game called Journey. I don't know if you know it, but basically, it's uh, you run through a desert, okay. and it's a it's a very simple game, but it's it's based on emotions, and you go through several emotions while playing it, and. Um, what they created is that um, there are there is someone running with you, basically through the desert. You are okay. running towards a light, and that's all. You cannot fight. You cannot talk. You can't you can't do anything. You can help each other with one very simple mechanic, but that's it. And I think this is very personal now, but this very experience was just super, super nice. You were able to play synchronous at the same time. You knew there is somewhere, someone on the planet. Uh, just running through a desert with you right in this moment. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how we create this on um, on mobile, and I don't even know if there are more people enjoying this than me. <laughs> right. But that was a very, very nice experience, and I still admire them for creating that. I think there, there's there got to be something there that between, as you guys have figured out with the, the sharing of the, the, the life, the sharing of the wand, there's got to be a personal edge that can be shared. And, and maybe even on the case of, like you said, an emotional edge to a certain extent that can I mean, be shared that will add to the virility. 
I totally agree. I mean, even Words with Friends, that's now years ago, but I was playing Words with Friends with a friend or someone I knew in Los Angeles that I hadn't seen for forever, right? Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden you have this personal connection and you are playing a word game together. That's very simple. Yeah. But um, you were able, I think, even to chat at the site. And it was, of course, not about chatting. It was really about um, playing this word game. Sure. But then you would also say hello. And then you would have had one personal interaction with some with someone that you hadn't seen for quite a while. And that, I thought, as well, was a very cool experience. So I'm sure there will be um, other ways in games um, where people can connect with each other. Stephanie, for the past 40 minutes, uh, you've discussed with us and give us some, some fantastic insight, in, not only into your monthly meetings and through the hit filter, but metrics, different design. You've pointed out some of the viral mechanisms in mobile games. And I believe that you, your, uh, if, if for whatever reason uh, mobile games goes out the window for you, you would be a fantastic therapist. That's the, <laughs> that's the belief that I get. So, Stephanie, thank you so much for your time. You are now officially free to go. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Michael, for and, the talk. And to all of you... Thank you so much for listening. This has been the App and Top Mobile App Marketing Podcast. Please make sure you visit our daily blog, blog.appandtop.com, where you can find all of this great information and much, much more every single day. Until next time, I'm Mike Bauer. See ya. The App and Top Mobile App Marketing Podcast is produced by appandtop.com.